2021 marks the 300th anniversary of the death of Grinling Gibbons, the country's greatest woodcarver. And today I'm joined by Hugh Wedderburn, the secretary of the Master Carvers Association and architect Jonathan Louth, who is program advisor to the Modern Legacy Project linked to celebrations of Gibbons' life and work. So Hugh, can you start by telling me about the significance of Gibbons to the English Baroque period and to carving today? For, for carvers, Gibbons is, is immensely important. I mean, born in 1648, influenced by the prevailing Renaissance style in the Netherlands, it's worth noting that Gibbons was not just a wood carver, but he was a stone carver and, and also modelled in clay for bronze casting. So as far as the Master Carvers Association is concerned, he covers all the disciplines that we represent. So Gibbons arrived in England at an opportune moment, just at the Restoration, when um, the arts were undergoing a resurgence and with the Age of Enlightenment taking off. And initially carving religious scenes from well-known masters engravings, um, King David panel is a notable one, and the crucifixion by Tintoretto was, was the famous one that he was reported to have been carving in Deptford shipyard when John Evelyn discovered him and, and uh, introduced him to the court. But this subject matter was a little bit too Catholic for the Protestant times. And so he adapted the less controversial representation of natural history, the vegetation, game, wildfowl, fish, crustacea, and seashells. His virtuosity was so evident that he lifted the existing English style that was slightly mundane in, into the absolute superb, which can still be seen if you visit the Wren Library in uh, Cambridge at Trinity College or, or the famous Riridos at uh, St. James's Piccadilly, the other famous Riridos at uh, Trinity College, Oxford, all absolute masterpieces where you really get the sense of how he could transform wood into, he could imbue life into the wood. It was this sort of sense that representations that he was depicting were actually living living samples, which I don't know, this is extraordinary and so, so inspiring to any car. We also have to um, <clears throat> have to recognize the fact that he was working for the, the eminent sort of patrons of his day, which was embroiled in the issues that are now highlighted by Black Lives Matter. I mean, his, his patrons were the uh, people who'd made that, were, were making their, their profit from uh, the Royal Africa Company, the East India Company, and the exploration and colonization of the Americas. So this is something that slightly tarnishes his legacy, but nevertheless, he's remained inspirational and the taste and styles change without wanting to pastiche his work. He's exemplary to um, modern day carvers who aspire to his, to his ab ability. And, and restoration and conservation work is obviously very important to, to traditional carvers, but uh, we also like to feel that we're capable of innovative work. And this is where it's so important that we link up with contemporary architects to find out, to discover new ways of, of softening and humanizing sometimes austere and rigorous designs. We can take this occasion of uh, Grinling Gibbons fame to demonstrate that the, the, there is a capacity to carve and design that still exists. And, and hopefully by linking up with architects, we, we can reinvigorate this, this heritage practice. So tell me what, what events have you got planned for 2021 to celebrate the anniversary? So the Grinling Gibbons Society has been putting together a Grinling Gibbons tercentenary programme, which we aim to launch on the 3rd of August, which is the date that commemorates his, I mean, that's the, 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 the day he died on. So 2021 this year will be the tercentenary of that death. Um, he's buried in St Paul's Church, Covent Garden, so we're very much hoping to have a commemorative service there, which is in, within easy reach of Bonham's showrooms on, on Bond Street, where they've offered us their showrooms for an opening exhibition to last for three weeks. The exhibition will have historic pieces that have been requested from various prominent collections, including the, um, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam, the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, the Royal Collections Trust, the Royal Armouries, the list goes on. And, and not just um, 
pieces of carving, but also the diary entries that uh, John Evelyn was making, which are at the Bodleian Library. And, um, and so we we're hoping for these prominent pieces. St. Paul's Cathedral obviously has got a lot of work from the choir stalls, which were conveniently moved by the Victorians. So <clears throat> they have boxes and boxes of pieces that never quite fitted into the, into the new configuration. And then we also hope to show pieces that were by other carvers, contemporary of Gibbons, who were in, inspired by him and, and perhaps lifted out of the mundane into, into the same sort of stratosphere that he exists in. And that's just on the exhibition side, which will then move up to Compton Verney. And this will link in with competitions, car carving competitions and demonstrations, talks, lectures, so academic work as well as practical work of new research into Grinling Gibbons. Christopher Rowell at the National Trust is, is writing a new passage for a book on Petworth House, which will he'll share his, his knowledge and insight into uh, Gibbons. So yeah, there's a wide program of events coming together and, and the greatest project is what I hope Jonathan will now talk about is the Modern Legacy Project, which is where we really are hoping to take the, the inspiration of Grinling Gibbons and, and use it as a launch pad going forward into the future. Well, Jonathan, uh, yes, do tell us about the uh, legacy project that you're planning. Within the context of the livery guilds, um, there were over a hundred guilds and liveries attached to the Corporation of London's governance and structures. Over 70 of those have a making and a constructing background from masons and carpenters and glaziers through to cordwainers and pewterers, broderers. Um, and the possibility of a collaborative modern project within the city of London is what the modern legacy is about. The idea that there will be a project that we develop and launch over the coming year, year and a half, Carvers, for example, someone physically carving, form the model to plaster work in ceilings, to engrave numbers that then get uh, die stamped, to uh, seals and the like. The work of carvers underpin many manufacturing tasks. Of the 70 or so trades and guilds represented in the, uh, in, in the livery company, over 30 of those actually do things for buildings. So the possibility of taking a building where the brief itself incorporates a search, both an apprentice, journeyman, maker and master maker in many different disciplines, from doorknobs to seat numbers, from portal decorations to drapes and soft furnishings. Bringing that together as a brief in a, in a corporate project, in a public project, and celebrating all those makers is a plan for the modern legacy and bringing the worshipful companies together in a way they perhaps haven't done over 700 years. They've been competitive. So that's the idea of the modern legacy to say Grinling Gibbons is a forerunner of makers and those makers, their work lasts over centuries and becomes part of our heritage. Now, Hugh, I can see you're, 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 you are in your workshop at the moment uh, where you were speaking from. So tell me about your own work and, and the, the life of a carver today. I mean, it, it's a vocation really. And, and, and I always tell people that want to be carvers that you have to begin with a vow of poverty, which very few people ever break. You starve to carve is a, is a, famous, uh, is a famous slogan. But it's, it's something that we do passionately and, and um, my own work has varied from restoration and period style work. So a lot of the antique trade and um, historic buildings, the architectural ornament and uh, then contemporary designers who, who don't have a carving ability themselves will often ask us to carvers to realize their designs which is always interesting and again this is where I'm hoping that we can encourage architects to be a bit more forthcoming in in in, in their um their designs and and carving opportunities for carvers 
and uh, and then I suppose as a frustrated sculptor myself, it's always the, the most interesting work is when someone just says, "I want you to carve something for me," and out of conversations, you develop a series of drawings until my ability to carve matches their their wish. I'm about to start a huge uh, pair of war memorials for the Mercer's Company. I've come up with a sort of allegorical piece that I feel I can <coughs> indulge myself in the carving of it. I, I suppose you spend hours and hours at the workbench working away. You want to feel you're doing something that is um, engaging you in intellectually and, and as well as um, practically. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, speaking for myself, I mean, yes, as, as I was saying, most of us are sole traders and quite often workshops are tucked away in the middle of on back streets or in the countryside somewhere and, and we sort of wonder why we don't get the recognition we feel we deserve. So I, I was very pleased over 20 years ago when we moved here to be on a on a road. It's, it's one of the oldest approaches to London, what would have once been Watling Street. But there's a constant footfall outside the window, which I refer to as my actual reality interface, just to try and undermine the digital world. And it, it's great to have this constant contact with the public and, and know that people are interested in what I do, even if sometimes it's a little bit interfering and distracting, but, but it's, 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 it's very rewarding to have that contact. And the other thing that I think we're all very aware of nowadays is sustainability. So, so I've taken to growing trees on my workbench. It's my inner city indoor hedge, my inversion of suburbia. So I've got chestnuts and walnuts and, and oaks and yeah, I mean, a variety of trees that you can just gather through autumn, on autumn walks in, in London parks. And, um, and that's a constant reminder that when I'm carving through a piece of wood that represents decades of tree rings, tree growth, and, and then I look up and I see this thing that's taking, struggling to grow for th three or four years before I can release it into the wild. It's, um, it just puts into perspective the, the sustainability of growing timber. I mean, um, the Americas were once forested from coast to coast. And, and then we had, you know, we built London on timber that was imported from America. And um, how, how long is it going to take for us to, to reach some sort of sustainable forestry that we can start replenishing all these resources that we've been using. So, so that's, I mean, I think that that's, that's an important thing. And it's a, it's a consideration when you start thinking about CNC work and the rate of that, that eats up resources compared to hand produced work where there's a sort of synergy between uh, a sympathy between the rate of work and the rate of growth that's a very very relevant point to make at this particular time when i think coming out of uh, uh, the pandemic we're going to be even more aware of green space uh, the need for a greener environment and uh, obviously we need more trees in in cities so uh, jonathan and hugh thank thank you very much for your contribution and we look forward to uh, celebrating grin and gibbon's life uh, in the year to come. Thank you very much. 3rd of August. 3rd of August, <laughs> Bottoms. Thank you, Peter.